Thank you all for joining me today in today's talk about how to choose the right connectivity technology for your app IoT application at the dawn of the 5G era. So cellular IoT is projected to see nearly 20% of annual growth uh, through the next five years from 2022 through 2027 growing from 1.9 billion connections per year to an estimated 5.5 billion connections per year in 2027. So a major transition is happening. If you are in an industry um, where you currently work with connected devices, you might be looking to transition from wired to wireless or from an older technology like 2G and 3G to 4G and 5G. If you are currently working with devices that are not yet connected, you are likely looking at the many benefits that connectivity can bring to your applications. In today's talk, I will cover some of the options that you have specifically for cellular network connectivity. So what are your choices? Of course, there are the existing LTE categories that have been around um, for quite many years now. Of these, LTE CAT1 specifically is important uh, and relevant for IoT applications because of its medium data rates and low latency, which make it especially suitable uh, for applications ranging from video surveillance to point of sale terminals. Due to its broad global coverage, LTE CAT1 is also ideal for mobile applications such as telematics. More recently, um, Air interfaces have been introduced under the umbrella of LPWA or low power wide area. Those are LTEM and NB-IoT. They have been around since roughly 2017 and were introduced with 3GPP release 13 and 14. Interestingly, um, both LTEM and NB-IoT are considered both 4G and 5G standards. Um, and are considered forward-facing um, to be compatible with 5G networks. You might be wondering how is this possible that they're both 4G and 5G at the same time? So LTEM and NBIRT are built into the frame structure of 5G networks um, and therefore will be available on 5G non-standalone network options. Moving forward to 3GPP, 3GPP release 15. This is commonly uh, identified as the introduction of 5G because it specified 5G's three driving use cases. So in the bottom uh, left corner of this triangle, you can see MMTC, Massive Machine Type Communications, um, which is uh, the evolution of LTEM and NB-IoT. At the top of the triangle, you can see EMBB or enhanced mobile broadband. This is all about high data rates and it is the part of 5G that you are already most familiar with um, from your 5G enabled smartphone. Um, in the bottom right area of the triangle, you can see URLLC or ultra reliable low latency communication. This part of 5G um, will introduce many new, new use cases specifically about around robotics and autonomous vehicles. So we can think of these as say flavors of 5G that um, continue the several different LTE categories. For IoT applications specifically, most of them do not require the high data rates of EMBB or the ultra low latency of URLLC. So um, in the IoT space, uh, we believe that these will be fairly low volume yet high price point use cases that would specifically require those um, but remain niche applications. Another thing that you will notice on this graph is that there is not really a follow on defined for lower complexity LTE categories like LTE CAT1 and CAT4. In 3GPP release 17, this omission has been fixed with the new 5G flavor known as reduced capability or red cap. 
BedCap will be much lower complexity than EMBB with one to two receive antennas and no carrier aggregation. It can support MIMO, um, although fewer MIMO layers and provides the option for half duplex FDD. This of course brings pricing much more in range of where LTE CAT1 or CAT4 IoT applications are today and also enable significantly smaller designs. So we anticipate based on when the spec froze that the kind of bleeding edge of red cap devices will be available in market in late 2024. At Ublox, um, our customers often ask us, what is the likelihood of a 4G sunset? How can I make sure that my devices can connect in the future to future networks? So here's a graphic uh, from a trusted forecaster, Ericsson, who, by the way, have a vested interest in pushing the transition to 5G. They publish a mobility report and this graphic is taken from there. So what they can see as of today is currently 59% of subscriptions are still 4G. 33% um, of subscriptions are 2G or 3G, and only 77% of subscriptions are 5G. Um, moving on into 2027, they predict that still slightly less than half of all mobile subscriptions will be um, for 5G. So the truth is, is that it takes a very long, long time to migrate billions of subscribers to a new technology. And we predict that there's likely no place on earth in the next five years, possibly even 10 years, where there is not a 5G connectivity where, and not also available a 4G connectivity. So uh, now with all these technology option, options, there are many decisions that you have to make and choices to consider. Um, some of those are listed here. So for example, there is the where do I need to connect question. Not all cellular technologies are uh, equally available in every region around the world. So if you have uh, multi-regional or multi-country deployments, this is an important consideration that can affect your supply chain um, and also uh, your device design. How price sensitive is my application? Um, if you're planning a pet tracker or a high-end telematics device, your bill of materials will look very different. And depending on what that is, you might have to make concessions and prioritize uh, technologies based on uh, what you can afford within your device design. How much power does my application consume? So often a major criterion here is if you have a battery powered device, how often is it feasible for a technician or maybe a user to uh, go out and replace batteries for deployed devices? This is especially relevant in rural locations. Um, and then of course, power consumption also depends on other factors such as how much data are you sending and receiving, depending on your specific use case and the air interface technology that you choose, um, your battery might last from a day to every you know, five to 10 years having to change it. Is my device located in hard to reach areas? Hard to reach areas could be rural locations where there is spotty uh, cellular coverage, they can also be in buildings or uh, in underground locations where traditionally you do not have um, the best cellular network reception. And LP, LPWA applications, for example, provide better coverage in those areas. How much data am I transmitting? The amount and frequency of your data um, affects, of course, your rate plan, but also your power consumption. And your choice of module may enable a protocol such as MQTT that require a much, much less data overhead than, for example, other protocols like CoAP or HTTP. Do I need to track my IoT device? Um, many IoT devices do need positioning enabled so that their location can be tracked. 
And there are many decisions to make here. Uh, how often do you need your device's location? Do you need it on a continuous basis or maybe on an occasional basis? And how accurate does your location need to be? Are tens of meters sufficient? Is meter level sufficient? Or maybe even centimeter level? And last, of course, how much power does my retrieving my location consume? Especially important for battery operated um, applications. So on this spider chart, um, you can see uh, some of the technology correct characteristics mapped between your LLC, LPWA, and REDCap. In the top right corner, you can see your LLC providing the highest data rate and, of course, also the lowest latency capabilities. Due to its complexity, um, form factors built around your LLC also have to be quite large. In the bottom left-hand corner of this, uh, of this spider chart, you can see LPWA technologies collectively here listed, um, but essentially being LTEM and NB-IoT. And here you can see that they exceed in terms of power consumption and length of battery life, as well as coverage, for example, in buildings. In the center of the chart, you can see both LTE CAD1 and Red Cab mapped. So LTE CAT1 is slightly lower in data rate than what REDCap will be able to provide. This is also dependent on specific network implementation and configuration. Um, it will, however, be a lower data rate than, um, for example, your LLC can provide. It also does not reach the same um, power efficiencies that, uh, for example, an LPWA uh, air interface could enable. So if you're bringing an IoT device to market in the next two years, then these are your choices. There is NB-IoT, which of course is very low power and provides extended in-building and underground coverage. Its data rates are very low. As a matter of fact, they might be too low for certain applications. For example, if you need to provide firmware updates over the air. It is also only suitable for stationary devices. Mobile handover is not possible and roaming is limited. It is broadly available in China, but networks can be spotty elsewhere. LTEM has similar power and coverage characteristics to NB-IoT. However, it does support limited mobility and roaming use cases. It is broadly available in North America and network coverage is improving in many European and Asian countries. However, it is not available in China. Then there's LTE CAT1 and a subset of CAT1 called CAT1Biz. So one of the important things here is that CAT1 supports additional use cases, for example, voice calls and full mobility. Full mobility being defined as uh, sending uh, or receiving data from a rapidly moving object, such as a car, for example. It is also the most broadly available air interface out of these globally. So CAT1Biz, uh, as I mentioned, is a subset of CAT1. Um, it technically works everywhere, but CAT1Biz chipsets are of Chinese origin, at least of, as of today, and are not certified by certain network operators. Most importantly, it is not certified uh, by operators in the United States. There are also some caveats that come with it. Um, due to its single receive antenna impl implementation, there is about a 3 dB sensitivity loss, which makes it less suitable than standard CAT1 for voice calls. And um, there are, you're also more likely to experience coverage issues at cell edges, for example. Now, if you are looking three plus years out, you may also consider REDCap. REDCap will be provided at 20 megahertz bandwidth. Um, so in terms of data rate, very similar to CAT1, CAT4. Um, and we anticipate that at the moment, the earliest adopters in terms of application types for REDCap will be in the consumer wearable space as well as among stationary uh, IoT devices.
So to conclude, I would like to um, say a couple of words about Ublox and who we are and how we can support you. So our products and services connect and locate everything. Today's discussion was of course focused on cellular connectivity. And we have a broad portfolio of modules uh, with a focus on those air interface technologies that are most important for IoT, specifically LTE M and LTE CAT1, but also NBIoT, CAT4, and so on. In LTE M, we are a true market leader. We've had at least 25% market share since the inception of LTE M in, in 2017. And we're also the only cellular module maker um, that. Uh, produces its own LTEM chipset, meaning they're vertically integrated. You may wonder why this matters. Um, so most chipsets for IoT applications start out as smartphone chipsets, and they were designed with smartphone features in mind and with the faster life cycles of that market. Um, so by prioritizing IoT, we can focus on features that are more relevant uh, for IoT applications and also the often much, much longer life cycles that IoT applications require. Also, it means uh, there are fewer dependencies on key components, um, and that's become increasingly important in today's supply chain environment. So when it comes to location, um, that's probably something that we're best known for. Um, it's as a matter of fact where we started uh, 25 years ago. We have a broad portfolio of chips, modules, and cellular combos for IoT devices that can, uh, you know, can support really any kind of tracking and position need. We can help you select the exactly right solution for your IoT product. Last, uh, we have a number of uh, communication services um, that make it easier for IoT devices to connect with each other, specifically using the low data overhead uh, MQTT protocol. And we offer location services that can uh, enhance uh, your power consumption, as well as provide location even uh, during cases when GNSS satellite reception might not be available. So with that, uh, thank you for joining me for today's talk. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me at Sabrina Boshin at ublogs.com. I will be more than happy to get back in touch with you. Thank you for joining. <laughs>